Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. I was in right about middle school, going into middle school, when I decided I wanted to play football, all right? Um, now, you can tell by this massive, almost six foot, 165 frame that I have, uh, I was actually a small kid growing up compared to my, my friends. And then I was, um, had a late, uh, or actually an early birthday going in, so I was even younger, smaller. But I entered into this um, football league uh, Pop Warner, anybody remember this? So, um, you know, it was, it was a, a league, and, and actually it was the Pee Wee uh, <laughs> League, which is fierce and, and awesome when you think about that. But I was in the Pee Wee division and uh, going in. And, and so, but I was in the league, the way they, the dates worked out, I was, it was later. I mean, I was actually ended up being one of the older kids and, and maybe a little more athletic. And so I jumped into that and, and, uh, I, after, I think I got the uniform and I started to imagine myself as an NFL football player. And, I, you know, you, and you kids know this. Girls don't really understand this fully. But guys, like I, would, I put on the uniform, you know, you wear it to dinner. And, um, you know, you're there in the house wearing it around and you put the helmet on to go to sleep or something. And so I was um, really thinking, man, I, th I think I can do this. Uh, I played um, halfback, kind of running back. And I was, a, I was a safety corner back, and I ran kickoffs back um, and, until I didn't anymore. And uh, I got hit a few times, and it didn't take long for me to realize that maybe, maybe I wasn't going to be an NFL player. Um, because even now I know, right, that the average lineman, how about this, in the NFL, you know this, is like 6'5", over 300 pounds. That's a large, these are giant men out there. Um, Cam Newton, who plays quarterback, is 6'5", 250. I mean, I would be hanging on him, just kind of running around. Uh, or how about this? Um, Eric Gibson, he, he, he played for the Chicago Bears not too long ago, 6'7", 410 pounds. I mean, that, these are giant men. I, I could have worked out for years. I mean, if I'd have stayed on track, I could have just worked, I could have eaten like crazy. But here's the thing. Even there, I don't have the disposition. I don't have the temperament to be an NFL football. That's a violent sport. I mean, you got to want to hurt people to play that game. And, and so I could have worked out all of my life growing up and never have become uh, a, hardly a high school player, uh, much less a college or football player. And so the point is this, a lot of my friends, though, were, were football players. I ended up playing um, basketball early on, but the, even there, you know, not, uh, I was challenged. I was short, but I was slow. And so, um, and I, I ended up playing soccer and I found, well, there's something I could do. Now, those of you who are not in sports, um, and then like me, I found my proclivities, my gifts were more even in the arts as I was getting older. But a lot of my good friends, best friend played football. And there were times when I was like, man, I wish I was a football player. I don't know if you've ever felt that way. Some of you here in middle school or high school, I wish I was, uh, you know, and, and I kind of felt guilty. Like maybe I, I don't bring something to the group here. And, 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 you know, a lot of times we can do the same uh, in our spiritual lives. We can, we can really desire maybe to enter into some area of service or ministry and then realize we don't have the gifts to do that. And then maybe we feel guilty. And some of you, maybe you're like me, you know, humanitarianism is a really big thing these days. To be a humanitarian, that's a popular deal. And especially when a humanitarian crisis comes along, like Hurricane Harvey or Irma, right? 
And the, as image bearers of God, all of us, uh, humans have incredible capacity to do great things. Some of you know that J.J. Watt now has raised, what is it now? Is it over $35 million to help people uh, with Harvey and all that good stuff? I don't know if you've done something. Uh, I'll be real honest. Uh, I mean, I got on the phone real quick, started calling pastors as soon as Harvey hit. Uh, we've got some family down there, Stacy's side of the family. We, you know, I'm very concerned. Um, I contact our mission office, said, man, what are we going to do? We, Texas Baptist men are down there. What are we going to do? How are we going to serve? And frankly, I'm going to be honest. Me, personally, I've done nothing. I've done nothing. Not really. I haven't gone down there. Uh, Stacy and I bought shirts that say Texas forever on them, and proceeds went to, to help the hurricane. But I got a shirt out of it. I mean, like, that's pretty cool, right? So did I, re- I, would, I didn't give anything. Not really. Do you ever feel like I have felt kind of guilty? I mean, I, maybe it's me, you know, part of my, my ADD, you know, passion for, we got to help that, help, we got to do something. Frankly, we, we don't all make really great humanitarians. And I don't know if you have felt like me, like you feel guilty sometimes. You're not doing enough. Or you wish you could bring gifts to bear on this or that. And by the way, uh, Damon Barry, we've connected with our Texas Baptist men. We, we want to send a group. So watch for that in October. Because here's the thing. For years, they're going to be struggling and in need of help. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to move on. We're going to forget Harvey. We can watch pictures of, of Irma and how, all the destruction there. But we can feel guilty. Uh, or, or we could wrestle with how do we help and, and what do we do? And what I want to do today is really set you free, challenge you, but set you free to discover your gift and serve the way the Lord's designed you. I was not designed to be an NFL football player. I, I didn't need to get stronger, work harder, get meaner. In order to play football like that, I would need not just a better body, I'd need a new body. I'd need an entirely new body. And in Christ, the Bible says that God has made us new. And He's given us gifts. And today I want to talk about what it is to serve Him with our lives. And so as we think about all that it means to be committed to our church family here, and this is a good day for guests to be here, because we've been talking about what it is to worship God weekly together and the importance of that, to connect with others in our Bible studies weekly. We're a two-time slot church, and we've talked about the priority of that for every one of us. And today I want to talk about this critical piece of serving, because some of us, we find ourselves um, really focused and, 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 and even experiencing a lot of anxiety or even enter into despair or depression, and, and, and we kind of implode when we focus on ourselves instead of stepping out and, and actually acting in faith to serve others. And we start to see that we really can make a difference. And we start to come out of this kind of depressive state we find ourselves in. Do you ever feel guilty that you're not doing enough? That that you really want to serve, but you don't know exactly how to serve? You know, this past week was what North Texas Giving Day. Maybe you were part of that. People give and give. And then the next week, you know, not so much. I mean, we tend to be kind of ADD when it comes to serving others. And even in our serving others, are we really meeting their ultimate needs? Are we really reaching out to connect with people in a way that actually makes a difference? You know, so much focus has come to Houston. But I'm aware because we have family who have a little uh, fishing uh, cottage, little house in Rockport, Texas. Rockport was the eye of the storm. And they don't have the kind of infrastructure and help and focus that the nation has brought to Houston. And granted, you got, you know, fourth largest city in America, but Rockport and areas like that, Port Aransas, we, you know, are we really helping those who need it most? You see, we don't really make good humanitarians. Not really. We, we, we find ourselves wanting to serve, but are we really serving? And then what did Jesus mean? When he said, in the book of Matthew, there's this story you might remember where where this woman comes and she's anointing him with this expensive ointment. You remember this? 
It's kind of a strange story to us, but she's anointing him and blessing him. And others around there are saying, what what a waste. We could have taken that expensive uh, ointment, we could have sold it and given to the poor. That sounds noble and right, a humanitarian thing to do. You know what Jesus said to them? You're always going to have the poor with you. And what does he say? Was he just dissing the poor? Like, oh, there's always going to be poor people. No, then he added, but you'll not always have me. And he brought us all back to what matters the most, and it's him. So how do we serve in a way that really makes a difference? And he did tell us, meet needs of people, and then, through your good works, glorify the Father who's in heaven. Watch. They'll see how much we love. And then we talk about why we do. So in the end, doesn't it come down to motivation? We'll talk about that a bit today. So here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and turn uh, to the book of Ephesians. Turn to the book of Ephesians, and I'll guide us there. We've been in the fourth chapter uh, for the past uh, couple of weeks, and we're going to be there today. And here's really the main thing I want to talk about. How do we bring our energies, our resources? How do we serve? I'm guessing you're here today, and you do want to serve people. And many of you have found your gifting, you found your ministry, but how is it that we're to serve and maximize our gifts for the Lord? And how can I serve in a way that doesn't make me feel guilty? Or that I'm not doing enough. Because here's the truth, gang. We'll never do enough. There's always going to be more and more needs. And this message really has meant a lot to me. Because I I tend to just say, man, we got to do this and this and this. we got to help everybody. And I have a tendency uh, towards that. And, and, And it's really been a freeing thing for me. Here's what I want you to see. The main point of the message today is this. Christian service, what I'm going to call Christian humanitarianism, all right, is driven by a new heart and a new affection for God and his people. It's radically different when we get underneath it. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 is where I want to land. We looked at the passage before that last week, if you were with us. Before we get there, to set this in context always, uh, I'm aware some of you are here first time, uh, or maybe you haven't been here in a while. So what Paul's been talking about in this book is how we have been rescued from our sin. I mean, uh, uh, chapters one through three is all about what Christ has done for us. He says we were dead in our trespasses, and that's not a metaphor for Paul. Uh, he, he does, he's not like, we were kind of like we were dead. No, we were dead spiritually. It's possible to be breathing, to have a body, to be living, and to be a walking zombie spiritually. To be dead and not have the life of God in us. It happens when we receive His grace. As a decision, we receive his forgiveness. His spirit actually lives in us. Literally, we come alive in him. This is what he's been talking about. So we've been made new. We're now brand new, fully human, getting us back to who we're supposed to be. It's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. You're made new. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. The Bible describes people apart from, from God as old, okay? Not just a chronological thing, but former, even dead. So I want to talk about what it is to be a new human and enter into kind of a new humanitarianism. Humanitarian, this, this uh, suffix Aryan, uh, is to connect with a group, a belief, or a group of people. To be a humanitarian is to connect directly with humans, right? To be a part of helping others. The old human has passed away. God is making, bringing about a new humanity. This is the church. This is his people. So let's look at a new kind of serving, all right? Beginning with uh, chapter 4. I hope you have your Bible there. Verse 17. Now this I say and testify to the Lord. That you must, he's commanding, no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. It's just futile thinking they have. They are darkened in their understanding. Now, the Gentiles, those are those who have not entered into the family of God, not received God's grace, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They become callous. And they've given themselves up to sensuality. This is just a selfish desire to meet their own needs, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now notice that prior to Christ, we are a mess. 
Now, we don't often think of ourselves that way, and we look at those who don't know the Lord, and we think, well, that's, they're doing pretty amazing things. Um, what's the difference here? Well, I think Paul is getting to it. We, we're actually ignorant. Old humans don't make for very good humanitarians. We're distracted. We're unaware of what's most important. We're not thinking of eternal needs. We're, we're focused on ourselves primarily. We're, we're, we're self-centered. We're calloused. We're hard-hearted. And, and it must uh, be that we, we've got to understand that, that really maybe we're helping in ways that can actually hurt. Maybe you know the book, When Helping Hurts. There's ways that we do humanitarian work that actually helps people who are poor. I mean, hurts people who are poor. And is not helpful. So often, the work that we see is not always bringing about sustained help. So I know our missions office and people who are so smart around those decisions that we make are seeking to really help bring true uh, help and redemption to people. But you know, we're pro this, we're anti that, and we find ourselves jumping from one thing to another. We don't recognize that humans are hopelessly broken apart from Christ, and the thing that we need to bring, yes, to meet physical needs, but the greater need for all people is the gospel. And if we're not bringing the gospel to our humanitarian efforts, then we're not truly helping people. And even when we do, isn't this true? Let's be honest. I'm hoping that you're thinking about your own life. Even when we serve, we we actually kind of want to get credit for it. Um, I've seen celebrities who've, who've gone and helped or sung to those who are you know, in, in these places, uh, these shelters and such. And that's all great, but how do we know about this? Well, because they took a selfie. They took video of themselves doing it. That's how we know, right? And I'm not knocking that, but isn't that what we do, right? We go and serve and, hey, look at me with this little orphan kid. Hey, what's up? You know, and, and, and we actually want to get some credit. We actually give, uh, frankly, some of us give and we get our name, maybe, put on something. I mean, if you give enough, right? Or maybe you want to be on a board and you really like the fact that your name is on the board. Now, that's all great. And I mean, I'm telling you, gang, our members are on just about every Christian board in the city of Dallas. And that is an awesome thing. That's an amazing thing. But when we get to the motivation, I just want to challenge us here. And when we think about uh, Christ and how he has shown us to, 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 to give ourselves freely to people, uh, without anything in return. And we start to check our motivations. But the first thing I want you to see is that old humans, yeah, make bad humanitarians. Well, secondly, I want you to see this. A humanitarian God makes new humans, all right? So nobody is more pro-human than God himself. Look at verse 20. But, here's the big shift in this passage. But this is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus. Check it out. And the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He says, but there's a new way to live. And what's happened is our great God has given us new life. God is the ultimate humanitarian. It's what theologians call, uh, it's, a, it's a Latin term, pro nobis. It means God is for us. No one is more pro-human than God himself. He sent him Himself to us, His Son, Jesus, comes to us, the greatest human who's ever lived. He was 100% divine, but He was 100% human. He was, he was the most human human that's ever lived. And He gave His life to us, what we see in the gospel. He, he taught us. God has always been reaching out to us, not holding our sins against us, but seeking to, to, to love us and to draw us to Himself. And Jesus did this. He taught and he healed. He met needs. He was the perfect human. And we follow after him. But notice too, even Jesus didn't fix everyone. You ever, ever thought about that? He, he chose who he would serve. And he didn't feel guilty about it. I think that's a good word for some of us. Once we find how we've been designed, and God has, has designed us to serve him in a certain way, we need to go hard at that with all that we have. 
and not feel guilty that we're not doing something else or that someone else is doing. And here's the other thing about that. And I know I can fall into this as a pastor, as a leader. My passion may not be your passion. And what happens in the church is when I've got this passion, you can imagine during, uh, sorry, just let you in a little bit, during budget season, we're trying to allocate funds and resources. What happens is, well, I'm passionate about this and everybody ought to be passionate about this. Not everybody's passionate about what you're passionate about. You know why? Because we're the body of Christ. We have different parts of the body and we have different passions. And that is the beauty of the church. It's why people come, you can imagine, to my office and say, Pastor, can you help me with this? And I I tell people, my job, I'm constantly saying no to really good things. Or I can't survive, right? So I get get asked to do things all the time. But here's here's what I've learned to say, because it's so true. I want to help you. I don't know if I can help you, but we can help you. Because I'm just one person, right? You're just one person. I have certain gifts. I have very limited a number of gifts to bring to bear on what God is doing in the world. But it's so beautiful to be in a church like ours and say, you know what? We have excess of gifts. We can help. Whatever the need is, we can help. And so together as new humans, we learn how to be new humanitarians, all right? So if you're a believer in Jesus, you're not an old human anymore. You're not a former human. You're a new creation. God has given us a new life, and he gives us the blessing of serving others. And notice that it says here, the holiness and righteousness of God. This this word righteousness can be translated justice. No one is better at doing justice than the new human who has received the justice of God because Christ has taken our sin upon himself. We, we know God who is literally justice and righteousness and holiness. We know what it is to serve others. See, if you wonder why you don't serve as much as you should, and some of us feel guilty about that, maybe it's not because you're lazy. Maybe it's because you haven't fully grasped what Christ has done for you. You're continuing to hold on to the old man, to the old person, and you're not, you've not realized that you, you're a new person with new affections because Christ has changed your life. Now, you may think, but I, I, I feel so under-equipped. I don't, I don't feel like I have anything to offer. Truthfully, some of you feel that way because we somehow have measured gifts and some are greater than others. We tend to kind of go there. But thirdly, I want you to see this. New humans have new gifts. We looked at this last week a little bit, so I'll go through it quickly. But in, in verses 9 through, uh, look at 9 through about 14, it says that, that Christ, who was at the very top, came all the way down and he's given gifts, each one according to the measure. Notice that the gift you have, this is, this is an amazing thing. Jesus gave you that gift. He gave it to you to steward for him and on his behalf. And then it says in verse 11, he gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds and teachers to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. That all of us have opportunity to serve so that we all together. This is a beautiful thing. This is the church. We grow up to mature manhood. It's this idea of little children becoming grown adults to the measure of the stature and fullness of Christ. That's what we're doing as we serve together. It's a beautiful thing. New humans have new gifts. Christ has delegated those gifts to each one of us. And then fourthly, I want you to see this finally. New humans have new ways. Not only do we have new gifts, but we have new ways. I want to spend a moment. Look at how this scripture teaches us how we're to serve together. Look at verse uh, 25. Verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood. Okay, now that we're new humans, let each of you, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Let's be truthful because we're essentially one and the same person. We're part of the same body. So the first thing I want you to see here is we serve honestly. We serve honestly. If we can help with something, we don't hide behind some lame excuse. Everyone knows you're lying. You can help. We can all step in and help. Don't overpromise at the same time. Sometimes we have to say no, frankly. You have to say no. I have to say no. To be honest and, and not overpromise. Serve honestly. Look, secondly, look at this. We serve passionately. I love this. Look at, uh, look at what it says in verse 26. Look at verse 26. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. I want you to notice here, he says, we're to be, be, be passionate about what we do. Here's a, here's a diagnostic question that I think is helpful. What is it that you can't stand anymore? What makes you angry? I can say it this way. What is it that you hate? When you see others who are being treated in ways that are not fair, for some of you, you can't stand the fact that a child wouldn't grow up knowing how much God loves them. That's your passion. You want to hold babies. You want them to be comfortable and loved. Some of you have passions about injustices that you see. But, but what is it that really upsets you? What makes you kind of crazy? That gets to the heart of your calling. Uh, you know, for me, a lot of you know that I, I mean, what is it that you can't stand anymore? That's really the question. I can't stand um, graceless Christianity. I can't stand legalism. Uh, I can't stand injustice that's brought towards those who maybe not, don't have a voice or who are, are weak. Many of you know I have a passion for racial reconciliation. That's not everybody's passion. And as a pastor, I need to recognize that. And I can seek to mobilize and, and, and help and guide people that way. But your passion may be different from mine. But that's a great diagnostic question today. If you're wondering, I don't know what my gift, gift is. What makes you angry? Dive into that. And you're going to serve with passion. So not only do we serve honestly, we serve passionately. We serve hard. Look at verse 28. It says this, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Notice the thief is supposed to stop stealing, okay, self-serving, and he's supposed to work to give, that is serving others. Here's a real challenge for some of us. Instead of you just kicking back in your chair, enjoying the AC and the lights being on and coming to this great church, are you, as Malachi would say, sorry, but... Are you robbing God? I mean, are you just a taker or are you a giver? Even Jesus who said to us, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I'm trying again, not to make you feel guilty, but to experience the blessing of service. To give and so that you will receive. You'll be the one. And I would say this too. If you're not yet serving, there's something that's not yet happening because you're not yet doing it. That's why God's brought you to this church with your gifts Look at this in verse 29. He says that we're to serve vocally. Let, not, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only speak such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Give grace to those who hear. What is this? Well, that's, that's speaking the gospel. It's sharing the truth of Christ, but also even as we serve, to share the hope and why you do what you do. Even today, some of you will be serving together, or this week, and as you do, speak. Why do you do this? Encourage. Don't tear down, but build up. Next, we serve through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of of redemption. Now, to grieve means to offend or not to offer his rightful place as a ruler in your life. As we serve together, we serve by the power of the Spirit. He's our friend. He's our comforter. He's the one who guides us in everything. Don't grieve him by putting on the old man, by going back to your old ways, being fractured and selfish, seeking attention. And then finally, we serve in kindness, love, and forgiveness. I love this. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. We serve in kindness, love, and forgiveness. So I want to ask you, Maybe the key question today is this, what's your ministry? What is your ministry? You say, well, I'm not sure what my gift is. How do I figure that out? Well, there's, there's ways to do that. You can go online, take a little quiz. That's probably the worst way to do it, frankly. The best way, you know what the best way is? Dive in. Jump in. Talk to people who know you well. You're going to find your gift. 
But really, be intentional. Discover what you do and go at it with all you've got, and then others will take care of the rest. And if you feel guilty for not doing more, we'll never do enough. There's real freedom in discovering what your gift is and sticking to it. And then allowing the body to be the body. There's faith as we offer to others to say, you know what, together we're going to do this. But as I'm praying for a volunteer revolution in our church, it's going to take every one of us doing our part. So what's your ministry? How are you serving the Lord in and through His church? Step out and do it. You know, I was not designed to be an NFL football player. I have other contributions to bring to humanity. But I know this, as a new man, as a new people, ultimately where all of history is heading, all of life is heading to a a new people who are on a new earth, a resurrected earth, worshiping a resurrected Savior. And it's why it says in Revelation 21, 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. We can join him even now. God, the great humanitarian in Christ, has made us new humans. And he's given us new gifts and new ways to serve others that will change the world. And he's invited us to join him. What a Savior we have. Join him today. Give your life to Him by serving Him, worshiping Him with your life. Let's pray together as we close our time. Lord, I thank You for Your grace. I thank You that You've created us new. And we can now serve other people. I thank You, Lord, that, uh, that You alone have given us gifts. You've distributed Your gifts. You've delegated Your gifts to us all. And I pray, Lord, that you will call each of us to serve you. And I pray every person here will be set free and will serve you out of our great love for you. That you will find each of us serving you because of our our great love for you, because of your love for us. So, Lord, we, we give our lives to you. We receive your grace. We We give you all that we have. Let us serve you with joy as a church family, as individuals. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.